Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Let's get into a little more revelation. Matthew chapter 21, and we'll begin reading because Matthew chapter 21 is about the triumphal entry. And in chapter 21 it says, And when they approached Jerusalem, now this is on the 10th day of Nisan. Jesus is about to die four days later on the 14th day of Nisan. We know he was resurrected on the 17th. So here Jesus is coming in. It's a triumphal entry. A triumphal entry. Do you think that Jesus will return again? It will not, will not be called a triumphal entry? Oh, yeah. He comes riding in on a colt or a donkey, a beast of burden, but next time he comes riding in on a horse. Ah, so the first time he's riding in in the springtime on, uh, you know, a donkey, next time he's going to be riding a horse. And where he came full of humility and humble. He ain't coming like that next time in the spring. Do you realize that Jesus can come back now? This is the time that you need to be looking for him. You ought to be ready more now than ever. Your Lord can come for you and me. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Can you say that? Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, come. Are you ready? Amen. Have you worked for him? Yeah. Have you been busy for him? <coughs> Listen. He says, um, And when they approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethage, Bethage, that word means the house of unripe figs. He's coming to a place that's unripe. At the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there to, uh, with a colt, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Um, and if anyone uh, says anything to you, um, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. The reason, um, well, I'm going to keep reading. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king, your king, when the Bible says he returns, he comes as king of kings. That should be another indication when he's coming in the springtime, right? Because this is when he died. Behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, uh, the foal, the beast of burden, right? Gentle, that means full of humility. Right? The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the colt. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds are going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! There's another indication of his coming when he's coming. Right? When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Wow, a lot of people are going to say, when he splits the sky, who is this? And we're going to be saying, It's Jesus, baby. It's Jesus. Wait, let me say that again. When, it, when, when the earth splits, you know, and the horizon splits as far from the east to the west, and lightning comes, and he says, that's how his coming is going to be, and it's going to be in the spring time, right? And they're all looking up. Man, what is this, a spaceship? No, baby, this is Jesus, and he's coming for me. <laughs> yep, the spaceship is coming for me. <laughs> all aboard! Woo! This is the last call. Hope you got your chicks. <laughs> we had entered Jerusalem. All the city was stirred saying, who is this? That who is this right here? I'm going to say right here. Hold on. I'm going to write in my Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> It's Yeshua. This is the prophet Jesus uh, from Nazareth of Galilee. Um, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overchanged the tables of money changers and the seats of those that were selling doves. So he's cleansing house. So when the Lord returns, he's going to cleanse house. You understand? He's going to clean up house. That's what he's going to do. 
And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Wow, there's a lot going on in his house right now. Robbing the people, telling them they need to pay their tithes. When the Bible says that only the Levites were required to take a tithe from the brethren. And if you want to be a Levite, be a Levite. But I fall under the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Judah was not required to take a tithe. Amen. Levite, the law, Judah, grace. Have your pick. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. That means when the Lord returns, he's bringing healing. Amen. Right? That's what the Bible says. There was healings in his wings, in his Titsi and his Talit. So when he comes, we're going to be healed, restored from this mortal body. It's going to put on immortality. Right. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant. Why? Because that's where the Messiah was going to come through. David. They were saying, this is the Messiah. Because the Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David. And he, and he said to them, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus, uh, and, and Jesus said unto them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, the children of Christ, you have prepared praise for yourself. Man, he brought them to the scripture, telling them and showing them, listen, they are professing to you who I am. Amen. Right? And he left them and went out to the city. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany. Bethany means house of poverty. That's where he went. That's where he laid his head. He didn't go to the rich and famous. He didn't go to the big ones sitting up in the, you know, the big monkey monks. He went down to Peter of no education. He didn't go to the Levites. You know, Jesus, he went down to the fishery. They didn't graduate from school. They wasn't fit to go to school. They, you know, they wasn't like Paul and all. He went to those guys. The rejects. That's who he went to. He went to the house of poverty. Now in the morning... When he was returning to the city, he become hungry. Now, you know, this is the Lord when he comes, is he going to find favor? When he comes, he's looking for fruit. You realize that when God gives you something, he is expecting a harvest from you. When someone sends you to go to work, they're expecting a harvest from you, not to just give out, give out, give out, give out. Right. You're required to sow what it is that you have, whatever that is. What is that? Whatever it is the Spirit of the Lord has revealed to you, of giving you, share it. So it'll multiply. Don't hide it. Don't bury it. Come on. Now in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry, seeing a lone fig tree. Now what's amazing about this, it says that by the road, he came to it and found nothing on except leaves. Why? Why? This is a, this is a liken. And Jesus said he likens his coming to the fig tree. When it yet puts forth its bloom, it's green. So will my coming be. When does the fig tree do that? In the springtime. Man, I was looking, I was rubbing and touching and feeling, looking at my fig tree in the backyard. Man, a little bitty green sprouts are just turning out. You know what I was thinking? I even said it to the tree. You know the Lord can return right now. This is the time he said, look to the fig tree. And I know about fig tree, likening it to Israel in 1948. I can get into all of that. But that's a physical outward sign. Look at that fig tree. Hallelujah. My God, right now, Jesus could come. That's right. That's right. Just like we know, if you know anything about planting and farming, you know when winter's finally over, you can look to what tree? Anybody know? A pecan tree. The le when you see the pecan tree put forth green, winter's over. It's done. Finished. Finite. No more. Obsolete. Hasta mañana. Gone. That's how it's going to be when Jesus comes. So he's given us something that we can look to. A literal fig tree. Man, if you don't have one, go buy one. Put it in your backyard. So you walk out there, man, you start seeing them blooms, start looking up. Man, Lord. 
talk to that fig tree. I was talking to mine. <laughs> little fig tree. Little do you know. Oh, he probably knows. <laughs> Man. Seeing, the, seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall ye ever bear any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, all the disciples were made, asking, What did that fig tree represent? It represented the law. The old covenant was the fig tree. Right? It was going to be done away. It was going to wither and die. It was going to go away. Why? Because he was coming forth. You can't establish a new covenant without, you know, denulling or disnulling or nullifying an old covenant. That old covenant had to go away so the new covenant could come forth. When did he come? It was during the feast. The feast of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits of Pentecost. That is what's going on. He's coming as the Passover lamb. He's saying all oh, that's going to be done away with. The sacrificial system is going to be done away with and gone. And a new covenant's going to be established. Ah! Uh, that's what he's talking about. That's why I died. And then, what's really amazing, let's read the next verse. This is really gets awesome. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Truly I say unto you, if you have faith and do not doubt, he's the olive tree, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only be able to do what was done to the fig tree, Meaning that you will be able to cast off that law. Now watch what he likens it to. The fig tree. He let, remember I told you about the fig tree represents mountains? Remember? Right. Remember? Watch this. He says, but even if you say to this mountain. Oh, my God. Wow. The old covenant, new covenant. The two mountains, the two fig trees. Olive tree, right? The olive tree and fig tree. Mount Olives, Mount Moriah, fig tree. Remember that? He even likens it to a mountain. Then where does he cast the mountain? Let's read. Gets you better. But he says, But if you even say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, it'll even happen. Why does he say that? Because the Bible says the law shows you your sin. Ah. And the Bible says if you ask for forgiveness, he takes your sin and casts it in the sea. The same place the mountain goes. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> in all these things you and, and and all things you ask in prayer, believe and you'll receive it. Remember, they're gonna have a serious battle. They they got these two mountains they have to deal with now, the new covenant and old covenant. You mean I don't have to go to that, you know, look man, I, I gotta go bring my lamb. I know you saying you're the lamb. Oh, but if I don't go and offer my lamb, I won't be forgiven. Man, come on. Man, he's saying, no, if you have faith and if you can believe it's me, you don't have to take that lamb. Woo! What did you say? Oh, you don't have to bring your tithe to the temple either. What did you say? Amen. <laughs> you don't have to go to the Levites. You don't have to go to the priest. Just believe. Hallelujah. Made me want to turn my hat backwards. <laughs> I said, did you heard me? <laughs> did you heard me? <laughs> Man. Boy, he'll turn everything around. <laughs> and make you go the opposite way. Look, watch him. See the hat facing that way? That's where I got to go. Look. <laughs> right back to the word. All right, let's keep going. And when he entered the temple, verse 23, And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders and the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority? Check this out. Remember, this is all about his coming. This is all about the coming of Jesus Christ. Remember? Watch what he does. By what authority are you doing these things? They ask him. And who gave you this authority? Jesus. So amazing. So amazing, he says, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Which of you will tell me? I will also tell you by what authority I'll do these things. The baptism of John. Was it from, uh, was from what source? From heaven or from men? Listen. The Bible says before Jesus comes, Elijah must come. Ooh. And Jesus said, 
that John was the Elijah to come. Right. When did John come? In the springtime. Here it is. He's making a direct reference to his coming again. He's letting them know. The Bible says Elijah must come before the Messiah comes. Amen. So, by the authority that I'm going to tell you why I'm here and why I'm doing this, I'm going to bring you to John, who was the Elijah to come, and you missed it! That's by the authority that I do it. But you didn't see. So he's bringing them to his coming again. This is first coming, second coming. First coming, second coming. It's one coming. It's going to happen at the same time. God is the same. He's never changing. That which was is that which shall be, and there's no new thing under the sun. Right? That's why he makes the connection there to John. You've got to think like them. No. Don't think like them. They missed it. Think like, like Jesus. Listen to this. He says, it says, the baptism of John was it from what source? From heaven or from men? And they begin reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, um, uh, wait, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regarded John as a prophet. He was the prophet Elijah. You see, that's the problem today. It's a problem today. People fear men. Amen. More than they fear God. Right. So they won't say what it is they know in their heart. Because they might lose people. They might be rejected. They might have to go stay in Bethany, a house of poverty. Well, that's where Jesus is. I'm sorry. You know, he wasn't arrayed in these big time garments and wow. yeah. he was in the house of poverty that's right and answering Jesus they said we do not know and he also said to them neither will I tell you what authority I do these things because they missed it <laughs> well if you ain't going to tell me I ain't going to tell you <laughs> but th this is what he says he don't stop there but he's amazing he says but what do you think? A man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he regretted and went. Man, that's me. Golly. Oh my God. Sister so-and-so called me up. Needed the pipes fixed. Man, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> A little while later. <laughs> Go fix the pipes. <laughs> Go cut the grass. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. And you don't go do it. And he says, the man came um, and he answered, I will not, but after he regretted and he went. The man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he didn't do it. He didn't go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said, the first. Jesus said unto them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Wow. That's us. We're the tax collectors. Right? We are the prostitutes. That's us. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Wow, that's a direct connection to Elijah. Elijah prepares the way. He was a preacher of righteousness. Right? But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. You see, because the Bible says that when Elijah comes, he's going to bring the heart of, back to the people. That's what he's going to do. And But these highfalutin, you know, priests and Pharisees and Sadducees, that I'm, you know, I'm not going to become like that. You know? 
no humility. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner. Wow. This is about a landowner. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out the vine growers and went on a journey. You know what that vineyard is? That's Jerusalem. So you'll know. That's Jerusalem. The wall that's around it. That's the vineyard. That is the vineyard. When the harvest time approached, he sent uh, his slaves, that means servants, to the vine growers to receive his produce, that be servants or prophets. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. The servants are the prophets. That's who he, he spoke, spoke to. Again, he sent another group of slaves, uh, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to him. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying... They will respect my son. He's telling him who he is. He's telling him who he is. He's the son. Right? But the vine growers saw the son, and they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Where did they kill Jesus? Outside the walls. Wow. See, this is all about his death, right? Therefore, therefore, when the landowner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretcheds to a wretched inn and will rent out the vineyard to another vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. That's right. The proceeds is people. The only thing you can offer Jesus Christ is people. Do you know that? The only thing you can give to Him is others. Some will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's what the Bible says. That had nothing to do with money. Watch this. And then He tells them. Jesus said to them, Did you never read the Scriptures, the sonnet the builders rejected became the corner? This came about from the Lord. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit. You're required to produce fruit. And he who uh, falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him into dust. Man, that's when the Lord returns. If you're fallen on Jesus and been crushed, meaning, I mean, he changes your life. When he comes... If you haven't fallen on him, well, he's going to fall on top of you. He understands the difference. Amen. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. This is all about his coming. This is where we're going to wrap it up because this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Remember, it's all about producing fruit. Amen. That's what it's about. The next parable he gives him is the parable of the marriage feast. Do you realize that everything he's talking about that I just read over to you is all about his coming? Wow. All about his coming. We know that when the Lord returns, we go to a marriage in heaven, right? So, listen to this. He says, The kingdom of heaven may compare to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. This is our job, right? Again, he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted livestock, or all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. This is the time of when his wedding is going to be. Our wedding. When we get married. It's okay. When we get married. This is when your wedding and my wedding is going to be with the Lord. This is when he's going to come for you and me. But they paid no attention and went their way. One to his farm. Another to his business. And the rest, and the rest seized his slaves, seized his slaves, and mistreated them and killed them. That's what's going to happen to you and me. But the king was enraged, 
Now I want to tell you, for you and me, this is the feast of Passover. Unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. This is Amen. a feast. This is a feast. Why is it called a marriage feast? Because this is the time it's going to happen. You understand? Our feast right now is the feast of Passover. Unleavened bread. First fruits and Pentecost, which is the Word of God. This is where we feast. There's literally a marriage feast that's coming. You and I, you and I have been called to do exactly what it is the Bible says here. To invite those to a marriage. This is what the Lord has laid on my heart. If we look at what's happening here, everybody is dialed in and focused in on the Passover. Right? About His death. But the other side of it is about the wedding. It's all about a wedding. It's about, it's, in, it's, a, it's about inviting those, your friends and your family, to come and eat at the master's table. It's, a by, it's about inviting others. I'm like, Lord, what are you telling me? What are you saying to me? It's exactly right. He said, I want you to have a wedding on my behalf. And we're going to do it on Passover. We're going to rent a hall. I don't know where the hall is going to be yet. We're going to make invitations. And we're going to send invitations out, like the Bible says, to all of our friends and family. This is what we have been commanded to do, to go forth and invite them.